Welcome to Acton Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. On February 17th, conservative radio broadcaster Rush Limbaugh passed away at the age of 70. From his humble origins as a rock music DJ in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, Rush rose to become one of the most recognizable names and voices in radio history, media history, and of the modern American political scene. Enabled by the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987, the Rush Limbaugh show went national in 1988, bringing Rush and his Excellence in Broadcasting Network to radios from coast to coast. At its peak, the program was heard on over 600 radio stations and attracted more than 20 million listeners per week. A cheerleader for conservative causes, Rush was no stranger to controversy. Indeed, in many ways, he courted it by, in his own words, illustrating absurdity by being absurd. In doing so, he inspired derision from his opponents, as well as the loyalty of his listening audience. What is the significance of Rush Limbaugh to American conservatism, and what influence did he have over our modern political culture? Today, I talk with Matthew Continetti, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, about Rush's legacy and his place in conservative history and conservative politics. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. I'm joined today by Matthew Continetti, who is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where his work is focused on American political thought and history, with a particular focus on the development of the Republican Party and the American conservative movement in the 20th century. Mr. Continetti was the founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon. Previously, he was the opinion editor at the Weekly Standard. He is also a contributing editor at National Review and a columnist for Commentary Magazine. Matt, thank you so much for joining us again on Acton Line. Thanks for having me, Eric. So Rush Limbaugh has passed away, certainly a significant figure in the history of conservatism. I wanted to reach out to you because I remember an interview, and I don't um, – forgive me for not remembering which one it was that I heard, <laughs> where you had identified Rush, uh, in particularly Rush going national in 1988 as a really significant moment in the history of American conservatism and the conservative movement. Um, what is the significance of him going national, his program being available all across the country to conservatism and, and politics? Sure. Uh, well, first, uh, how dare you not remember every single one of my interviews? You know, I'm, I'm outraged. Um, I forgot to reference the spreadsheet I keep on them. You should have them all memorized, Eric. Um, uh, let's talk about Rush Limbaugh. So he's without a doubt one of the most important figures uh, in the history of the conservative movement. Um, and in a way that's kind of unexpected because um, for many years, uh, talk radio was played a sort of underground role uh, in conservative politics. There, of course, there were the, the far right um, the political diatribes of uh, Father Coughlin in the 1930s. Um, then there was kind of the um, uh, anti-communist um, uh, Goldwater supporting um, radio show of uh, Dean Clarence Mannion called the Mannion Forum. Uh, which took off during the Eisenhower years. But really, um, uh, radio was not used all that frequently um, in the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, even the 80s, mainly because of the Fairness Doctrine, which um, was the FCC regulation demanding equal time for political viewpoints. So you couldn't um, have a liberal viewpoint without putting on a conservative, or you couldn't have a conservative viewpoint without putting on a liberal. Uh, at the end of the Reagan administration, um, Ronald Reagan, who had always opposed the Fairness Doctrine, uh, his FCC terminated it. And that allowed um, the conservative talk radio industry to thrive. And one of the first programs to go national 
um, almost as a direct result of the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine was the uh, program of uh, Rush Limbaugh. And from that moment on, uh, he became uh, not only the most popular conservative radio host, he also basically created um, the type of politics we have in America today, which is uh, basically almost a politics as entertainment, uh, brash, um, hum- you know, body, um, scandalously humorous, outrageous, um, and confrontational. Uh, and, and so um, Rush, you know, uh, all of the consequences of Rush, we, which we can get into, what, one of them was you can draw a line between Rush and the creation of Fox News Channel in 1996. How important was the fact that Rush was on radio to that part of his legacy, to, to what you just talked about there? Because I, I imagine, you know, if I think of William F. Buckley, who writes newspaper columns and publishes a magazine, um, both of which are products you would have to subscribe to in order to hear his views, or you could hear him on public television, on Firing Line, on PBS, but the accessibility of radio, it's in every car, almost everyone has a radio. I imagine there are a lot of people who discovered Rush in the same way that I did, which was when I was in college. I was working a summer job where I had a lot of downtime, not a lot going on. So I brought a radio out and flipped over to the AM band because FM was just terrible to me at the time. And heard this voice of a guy who I heard his name, didn't know much about, and started listening to Rush Limbaugh. I imagine there's a lot of people who encountered not just Rush, the personality that way, but a lot of the ideas that Rush was espousing, which may have tapped into things they previously believed or sympathized with without having been clearly articulated. But the accessibility of it on radio, I would have to think is a key part to why he becomes so successful and then influential. Well, for, you know, radio had long been a, been a refuge um, for the right, um, especially the religious right, uh, because, as you suggest, a lot of media uh, outlets were limited um, for much of the 20th century. I mean, you had a few big newspapers, really only one and a half national newspapers. I mean, New York Times is a national newspaper and the Wall Street Journal is a national financial newspaper, but really even the Washington Post was considered a kind of a local newspaper for the, you know, the home industry where I live, which is government. Um, And you had limited selection of television channels. Um, Even in the 1980s, uh, you had just the beginnings of CNN and MTV, which wasn't very political. So, you know, you had, a, you had PBS, as you mentioned, Buckley was on PBS, but even his show conformed to the Fairness Doctrine because Firing Line was a debate. I mean, it was always some opponent, uh, an interlocutor for Buckley. So uh, radio was ubiquitous and it was kind of a safe haven for uh, outside the mainstream uh, views, liberal mainstream views. Um, and primarily that was uh, religious uh, broadcasters. Um, what Rush's innovation was, he was a conservative who was not a religious broadcaster, right? Rush was, one of the reasons radio was important to Rush was radio was his first love. He wanted to be a DJ before he wanted to be a conservative DJ. He was a very good DJ uh, before he kind of fell into politics and his version of politics as entertainment. He was an amazing broadcaster. Even his most committed enemies, uh, the people who kind of celebrated his demise, uh, acknowledged how talented he was as a broadcaster. He had an incredible voice. He could hold your attention. He was funny, um, again, often in a shocking way, but still forcing you to laugh. Think about all the phrases he introduced into our political vocabulary. Feminazi, um, ditto head drive-by media. Um, uh, So he had a real impact on the language. Um, And yes, so he was also present in a way. People who have a car radio, people who have a radio, uh, you know, take a radio to work as you you did. It's funny, my, I first encountered him, this is kind of in character with me, I suppose, through his books. (laughs) And uh, when he was really taking off and becoming a sensation, he wrote, uh, he had collaborators, but he, his name was on the cover. He wrote two books. Um, the first was The Way Things Ought to Be in 1993. And then 
think in late 94, early 95 was the sequel, See, I Told You So. And I think it was around 96 or so, I was in junior high school, that I took one of the one or two of these books to the beach, just trying to figure out what Rush Limbaugh was all about. And then that was another aspect of his legacy. Because of the success of those books, publishers in New York decided, you know, maybe there's a market here beyond what, you know, Regnery Books was selling, the few uh, conservative publishers. So he helped create the conservative publishing industry just as much as he helped create the conservative talk industry, just as much he kind of set the template for Fox News Channel, just as much as he kind of uh, had a role in the Tea Party and the rise of Donald Trump. How important was Rush Limbaugh to the rise of the current media culture, where there is a very uh, adversarial relationship between the political right and the media establishment. And there are plenty of people who can document going back through time um, a, a leftward bent to the media. Of course, it's, you know, you're talking about a shifting landscape in the sense that you had only three channels and limited publications, as, as you'd previously highlighted. Um, but Russia's arrival and not just making uh, political foes in terms of the Clintons or Democrats as targets, but the media itself, which is now just such a well-established and common part of our political debate. Is he uh, a major cause of that, or is he just channeling what was already there into a form that we can now more clearly recognize? Right. I mean, I think he was definitely um, channeling something that was already there. I mean, the um, conservative distrust of uh, the mainstream media or the liberal press goes back decades. It definitely precedes Rush. Um, it goes back to the treatment of Barry Goldwater in 64. It goes back to the way that the press reported on Joe McCarthy in the 1950s. Um, what Rush did, again, was make it fun. Uh, and so he kind of, you know, he incorporated clips uh, from the TV broadcasters that he then responded to. He parodied the media. Um, he, uh, you know, he actually read what they wrote out loud and responded to it in some, in ways that were often, you know, uh, completely accurate, uh, pointing to the bias or pointing to the misrepresentation. He, um, he definitely gave us a more confrontational media, rarely any liberals on Russia's show, sometimes liberals called in and he would debate them, um, but he, he wanted to basically, uh, you know, take things to the left as much as possible, um, and and in and including you know Republican squishes uh, that he you know, Republicans who he felt were not uh, doing uh, performing according to uh, the canons of conservatism. Um, so that was kind of one of his legacies. The the radio host has to be kind of larger than life, you know, to command an audience. And Rush commanded the largest audience for three decades, which is remarkable in itself. Um, and so he, he was larger than life. Um, and, and that, and that kind of carried over into the way that he approached, uh, political debate or, um, kind of political criticism, which is really what he engaged in. If you look at our TV culture, um, the kind of the, you know, the, the screaming matches between pundits and everything, that I think is less Rush Limbaugh and more John McLaughlin, uh, the you know the ex priest and Nixon aide who created the McLaughlin Group uh, on syndicated television in the 1980s, and who kind of reveled in having his panelists um, you know scream at one <laughs> scream at one another over <laughs> over a hot button issues. Rush didn't really do that. It was a one man show, but his voice was so. Um, uh, captivating for his audience and so commanding uh, that he was able to really, um, you know, take the fight. And that 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 sense of fighting um, was, was one of his contributions to the right uh, today. The last time that you were on this program, we talked a lot about populism within the political right and the very populist moment that we're in right now. What role do you think Rush played in instantiating or, or emphasizing populism in in the political right is the 
there's something very populist about talk radio. As someone who's done some talk radio, I've filled in for people on talk radio. There is a very populist element to the medium, I think, and also just to Russia's politics. Uh, how responsible, and, and perhaps I can bridge this into what I think would be my next question, how clear of a line can we draw between Rush Limbaugh and that populist nature of our politics today? Oh, a direct line. Um, you know, he was, uh, he was an anti-establishment figure. Uh, he, he tore into the elites of both parties. Um, he had the sense, as he wrote again and again, that um, he was speaking for the country. And, um, you know, whether it was Bill or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, his opponents uh, were, were a ideological minority. Um, he, he, you know, he drove the Republican Revolution uh, in 1994. Um, he celebrated the Tea Party uh, after it started in 2009. And his approach to Donald Trump is very interesting to analyze. He'd known Donald Trump for some time, uh, but if you go back and read the transcripts of his program early on in the 2016 cycle, he was uh, slightly wary of him, uh, of Trump. Um, he, he actually defined Trump as more of a populist than a conservative, which I think is an interesting distinction. Uh, and a populist in Russia's view didn't really have any kind of principle, any anchor in principle. He just, the populist just wanted uh, the people to rule um, and overcome the elite. And Rush was distinguishing that between a conservative who believed in popular sovereignty, obviously, but also had these principles say, of limited government, of personal responsibility. Then, of course, I think partly um, out of the populist dimension to talk radio that you identified, which is the constant interaction with the callers, uh, Rush began to become more embracing of Donald Trump, uh, eventually reading Michael Anton's manifesto, the Flight 93 election, out loud on his program in September of 2016. So at that point, we can see that Limbaugh had fully come around to Trump and also to the Anton view that basically uh, America had entered an almost apocalyptic stage where the only thing preventing the end of American civilization what, w would be the election of Donald Trump. And so he, he was a rock rib Trump supporter from that point throughout, uh, throughout the Trump presidency. I'm curious what you make of, of some of Russia's actions in recent years. So one of the things that stuck out to me was, again, in the, the lexicon of the Rush Limbaugh program was his references to what the show itself was. It was the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. And he <laughs> often talked of running the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies, which in the last few years he changed the name of. Um, I can't remember what he changed it to, but he removed conservatism from the name of the, this um, theoretical institute that he was running as a daily radio program. Uh, what, what do you make of the modulation away from conservatism as being that leading edge of what, you know, Rush was identified as a, one of the most prominent conservatives in the media. And he seemed to back away from that. And I'll, I'll add one more thing and, and you could comment on it. I can't remember who I heard make this observation I had stopped listening to Rush a number of years ago, but they recalled tuning into his program during the Republican primary debates and hearing Rush uh, get ready to criticize something Trump had done and saying, I, like, I know, I know you're going to be mad at me. The Rush that I remember listening to wouldn't, I couldn't imagine him saying that, seemingly to be afraid of his audience's reaction to what he was about to say. Um, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about whether... You know, he may have been in recent years uh, captured by his audience as well in a way that I think a lot of um, I see a lot of opinion across the spectrum seem to have been captured in a way by the people that they're talking to. Right. I am. Um, I, I read uh, the, usually I read the transcripts of Russia's program just and kind of see what his uh, perspective was. He um, he became uh, 
disillusioned with a lot of what he viewed as the conservative establishment in Washington um, be, uh, during the Trump era. And so he, he moved toward a more Trumpian uh, standpoint over those years and, um, and, and embraced some of Trump's theories about what, you know, what, hap what happened during the 2020 election and such. And this might have been a consequence of changes in his audience. It might have been just his own kind of change in, in beliefs. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to say. What we can say is that the talk radio right, which is much of the right, which is the, really the grassroots of the right, um, came to identify personally with Donald Trump came to invest Trump with all of their hopes uh, for the future of America, um, came to think that Trump was not only the, the greatest president in American history, but someone who really could do no wrong or whatever wrong he did, what the left had done or was doing was worse. And uh, this is, I think, uh, defining the right, uh, especially in the months since the 2020 election, um, a view that uh, we're in, as, uh, uh, as the Claremont uh, writer Angelo Cotavilla put it, uh, a cold civil war, if we're not already on the verge of secession of states, as some um, members of Republican state parties have said that there is some kind of irreconcilable conflict ha happening in this country and that Donald Trump um, is the, the, the person who understands this conflict and knows how to uh, resolve it in the favor of the more traditional, one might say, um, uh, understandings of what America and Americanism uh, are. Um, Rush, I think, came to embrace that. Now, Trump, you know, understood Rush's power um, at, and, and used him as a friend and as an ally. And, and, you know, and, of course, granted him the Presidential Medal of Freedom the day after Rush announced that he had the, the, lung, the lung cancer that killed him. What's interesting is that Trump, in a way, it, you know, that I think envied Rush <laughs> Because <laughs> right before the election, if you recall, he appeared on the show, for like a radio rally, and he stayed on the show for, almost for the entirety of the three hour program. And where Rush Limbaugh was trying to say, oh, I'm sure you have things to do, Mr. President. And of course, not Donald Trump was, oh, no, no. And Donald Trump kind of viewed his office as the talk radio host in chief, as the guy who was going to kind of say, tell it like it is, you know, uh, from the Oval Office. So there was a real identification there. And I think this, the more data we see coming from the Republican Party and kind of the institutions of the conservative movement, um, that, that identification and loyalty to Trump uh, persists. One of the observable phenomenon is how politics has bled into so many other areas of American life and American culture where – Perhaps previously it w it would have touched it or and or would have emerged in significant ways, uh, but now seems to be just a regular feature of it. Sports is one of those that I think is clearly one that's been imbued with uh, politics over the last number of years, and you know, certainly politics had been discussed within a sports context before. But I'm I'm recalling Rush being a commentator for ESPN on the NFL and on the first broadcast he has making comments about Donovan McNabb, then the quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, do you think that, is this a blip or is, uh, and I'm, we're ascribing, I'm ascribing to it now more significance than it deserves because of Russia's passing, or was perhaps that a harbinger of the blending of political voices and other elements of pop culture that now seems to be a very clear thing that is, is with us? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Rush talked about culture a lot on the show, and uh, including football, which is one reason he was hired um, by ESPN. Uh, I think in retrospect, that was 
big mistake by ESPN. I don't know what they were thinking because <laughs> Rush was such a polarizing personality. He was going to, it was not going to end well. It, it had, the inciting incident happened to be his, his comments on, on Donovan McNabb, uh, which I think were ill concert, considered. Um, it, it, it does lead to the question about why Rush never really translated into other media. You know, he had a short lived television program, the Rush Limbaugh Show, which was syndicated. Um, and in fact, it was produced by Roger Ailes, uh, the founder of the Fox News Channel. And, but it didn't, it only lasted a few seasons, um, I think. And then, too, the, the books, you know, the, the two books the, that I mentioned earlier in the program, The Way Things I Ought to Be and See I Have Told You So, were huge successes. I mean, Rush could have written many, many more books. Um, not not the kids' books he ended up kind of promoting, but, but actual you know, books or just having his name on them, working with collaborators like John Fund, who worked with him on, on the titles, on those titles. Um, he didn't. He really was a creature of radio. He understood that medium um, in a way very few people do. And, and he, I think his devotion to it is, is a reason that he was so successful at it. Um, so yeah, he, you know, sometimes he'd show up on, on television programs, television interviews. It just wasn't, it wasn't the same. I think he had to be in charge and it had to be his show, uh, for it to really have the true effect. There was one, there's one exception to this rule, which is the speech that he delivered at the CPAC conference in 2009, which is a very interesting moment in political history because at that point, you know, uh, the Republican Party had been more or less uh, demolished after the 2006 and 2008 elections. There's no real um, sense of what, where the Republican Party should go. Um, the Republicans were beginning to unify in opposition to President Obama's agenda, but there were still plenty of people who thought, well, maybe because of Obama seems to be the singular political personality, we should try working with him and such. And Limbaugh really used his speech at CPAC that February 2009 to lay down a political and ideological marker and to say that conservatism would have to stand in distinction to Obama. Uh, he became kind of a, a, a transitional leader of the, of the right um, in that moment between uh, you know, the end of George W. Bush and the rise of the Tea Party and the Tea Party Republicans elected in 2010. So that was kind of where, and, and that was a televised speech, and it was really an important speech, I think, uh, for the conservative movement. Now, Democratic presidents loved making Rush the face of the Republican Party, um, and Obama kind of seized on that uh, simply because Rush was a polarizing figure. He was, he was um, someone that conservatives adored, uh, but that um, independents were split on and Democrats and even a few Republicans just did not like. Let's close with these two questions. The first one is an entirely unoriginal because I've heard a number of people ask it and debate it in the um, recent days after Russia's passing at the age of 70. Uh, so you have Rush Limbaugh, you have William F. Buckley Jr. Uh, the question being, which which played the more significant role to American conservatism? Well, there's no question. Uh, it was William F. Buckley Jr. I mean, there, there wouldn't be a conservative movement without William F. Buckley Jr. Um, he uh, created it. <laughs> he he um, uh, established the vehicle uh, where a mainstream conservatism could be worked out. He, um, and that was in that vehicle was National Review. Uh, he um, popularized conservatism. He modeled a form of conservatism that liberals could not ignore or dismiss, uh, but that could go toe to toe with the best liberalism had to offer. Um, it's you know it's hard to appreciate now uh, because Buckley has been gone for more than t 10 years. And even before his passing, you know, his moment was really between 1951 and kind of 1980, really. Um, but he was by far the more important figure. Rush Limbaugh was, was 
a huge influence on uh, millions of conservatives. Uh, but you know, he, he was a media figure. Um, he, he was, he was someone who, uh, you know, he railed against the Republican establishment. He didn't always win. Um, uh, but he was, he was adored by millions and he popularized a different type of concert, a slightly different type of conservatism than Buckley. He, he himself idolized Buckley. If you ever want to see an awkward rate, uh, television show, look up the firing line where Buckley interviewed Rush Limbaugh. And it's a fascinating thing to watch because one, uh, Buckley's kind of getting older. And so his voice is becoming even more languid than it always was. But Limbaugh seems genuinely nervous. <laughs> he seems like a little uncomfortable uh, being around this man that he worshiped. Um, uh, but there's no question that um, we've moved a, a, quite a ways from Buckley conservatism and, and Rush, I think, especially in the last 10 years, um, you know, helped us move in that, in that direction. So you are working on a book on the history of the conservative movement. And we asked you to assess at this point, that would be the question I just asked you um, to just speculate some. And I, I recognize the unfairness of asking this, uh, but imagine the Matt Continetti of the future um, you know, years from now working on a book updating your work. Do you think the influence of Rush Limbaugh will seem uh, more pronounced or do you think he will fade as a figure of prominence in the history of American conservatism? Well, he'll be in the book. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, I'm not just my book, but in whatever book that's written about American conservatism for the rest of American history. I mean, he, I mean, he, he played an important part as a broadcaster in the same way that books mentioned like a Dean Mannion, you know, or uh, Billy Hargis or Jerry Falwell, you know. Um, but when I look at the history of conservatism, um, you know, individuals matter uh, quite a bit. And individuals who matter the most are the ones who originate uh, ideas or establish institutions that um, can serve as incubators or vehicles of ideas. And then of course, they're the, the political actors themselves. So when you look at the large scale development of American conservatism, you know, there's no question that Rush Limbaugh was a, a, one of the more important figures of the conservatism of the last you know, really 30 years. But, uh, you know, he, how does he compare to a Buckley, to a Milton Friedman, to a Barry Goldwater, to a Ronald Reagan, uh, to a Donald Trump? Um, I, I think he he's not quite in the same uh, at the at the same level, despite his incredible importance and and his um, uh, truly unique connection to his audience. Matthew Continetti is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where his work is focused on American political thought and history, with a particular focus on the development of the Republican Party and the American conservative movement in the 20th century. Matt, thank you so much for joining us on Act in Line. Thanks for having me. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can reach our team at actonline at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.